kind of informal about it, so stop me or make a gesture or throw yourself in front of the screen if I say something that makes no sense or you want more detail or whatever. So um, uh, when I arrived here in, at the end of June, I was <coughs> chatting with my neighbor, Lola Bojo, who's here tonight, and she said, oh, I didn't realize you were an expert on the Nearing's construction method. And I thought, oh, darn. Because <laughs> um, there are so many <coughs> people in Brooksville and elsewhere who really are immersed in the um, Nearing's construction method. And, you know, there have, even, there have been demonstrations here of the method that I've oh, yeah. attended that were super illuminating. So I don't claim to be as immersed in the Nearing's as many other people are, but. Um, so my ex so I'm not an expert on the nearing uh, construction method, but my expertise is in 19th and 20th century architecture. So having hung out at, in Brooksville for quite a while, you know, I got really interested in the nearing, so I started reading about their construction, and uh, you know, I'm interested in all the people who came to me at about the same time who were very inspired by the material stuff of Maine, like rock, you know, the sculptors, like uh, the, um, you know, various sculptors who came here and direct carved on uh, granite, and people who love to work with wood and came here and did wood sculpting. So I'm really interested in that idea of the material of the state itself kind of drawing people, and the nearings are, of course, very central to that story. And being, you know, having been very interested in philosophies of craftsmanship in the 19th and early um, 20th centuries, I thought, well, of course, I'm going to read about the nearings and they're going to be totally immersed in William Morris and the 19th century arts and crafts movement. And I found out that that was not true at all. And so I became more and more intrigued by what their philosophy was, and um, you know, read their read their published writings, and also did quite a bit of research in the um, papers that are at the Thoreau Institute at Walden Pond, which is a gigantic collection of the Deering's um, writings and correspondence, really from their entire lives together. And you know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about that collection is the gigantic number of people who wrote to them over the course of years, you know, especially later in life when they were ensconced here at Harborside, and would say, you know, I'm, I'm you know, a recent college grad, I don't want to do with my life, I read your book and now I'm totally inspired to go live off the land and do exactly what you did. You know, and there's literally hundreds if not thousands of letters along those lines. And so there was something about them that was so attractive. And so that, that made me want to find out, like, what was it about them that drew so many people to them? And one of the things that drew people, I think, was this construction method that they wrote about <clears throat> in uh, uh, their, you know, books about the back, back to the land experience where they really detailed how they had built in Vermont and uh, here in Maine. And so that's what, that's what I began to think about. And I began to look into sort of what their, what their philosophical sources were. Um, in 1977, Mother Earth News wrote, wrote about them. Tick off any of the present, present's most in passions. Woman's lip equal rights, organic gardening, vegetarianism, radicalism, homesteading, subsistence farming, ecology, and we'll find that the Nearings have been doing instead of talking for 40 years. Well, we know that they did plenty of talking. Yeah. You know, they, they lectured widely, of course they wrote um, uh, uh, very, very widely you know, over the, the, the um, course of their years together, including about their experience building. So to get to the core of the matter, I want to begin with this pair of images that you probably wouldn't put together most days, right? So you have 
the house they built in Vermont that was built between 39 and 42, and then Wright's Falling Water finished in 1937. And you might say those things do not belong on the same screen, Professor Murphy, you're out of your mind. But I want to I want to maintain that there's a, a really deep connection. For one thing, uh, Falling Water, when it was completed, was internationally renowned and admired. So for example, in Mexico, it inspired a whole school of uh, architecture and building that used local materials, that used, in, in the case of Mexico, area around Mexico City, lava rock for modern houses. So, and they even, you know, on uh, brochures for developments of new houses around Mexico City, they have pictures of falling water, of all things, right, which they were never going to build, but it just shows you what a powerful image that was. And although what the Nearings built was rather different in appearance. There's a, a similar philosophy behind their architecture and rights. In fact, they refer to right all the time, which I found so bizarre at first, before I started thinking about it more, because, you know, the Nearings were these huge advocates of self, what we call self-building or do-it-yourself construction, right? Well, Frank Lloyd Wright was probably the opposite in, that, in terms of his philosophy of the involvement of clients, which he thought should be basically zero, you know, no involvement that, you know, he would design the building, he would oversee its construction, he would you know, decide what furnishing should be in it to the point that he kind of famously would go back and, you know, edit out the old homeowner's stuff because it conflicted with his aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, he had a very, very strong commitment to the idea of the architect as a professional. And here are the nearings saying, well, actually, you can design your own house and you can build your own house. So I thought, well, what the, what is the, you know, glue that holds these two things together. I mean, how could it be that these people who are all about do it yourself, back to the land, you don't need professionals for building or design or anything, can be so enamored of Frank Lloyd Wright. But in fact, what they admired about him um, were writings that he produced in the um, in the, around 1940, his book on architecture, we really espoused an organic kind of architecture, and that's what really inspired them in his writings. Not so much his professionalism and his kind of haughty artistic position, but rather the, the way in which he emphasized the construction of buildings out of the very materials of the land, especially at this key moment of the 1930s where they are getting going in terms of their own building. And so, you know, they they build this house out of stone that they find on the property and they're super invested in that stone. Stone for them, as many of you probably know, is more than, um, you know, stuff you dig out of the ground. It had a real spiritual weight. You know, they um, would talk about you know, going into the woods and selecting the stones and kind of communing with those stones, letting the stones speak to them. And Helen, you know, later in life talks about, um, you know, the process of, well, I'll talk more about it in a moment, removing the foreword from around the walls. And there you see those stones, which she describes as old friends. Yeah. You know, so that there's this kind of even personification of stone as a living So, I think, you know, there's this one wonderful note written quite late in life by Helen where she says, she writes in kind of this series of bullet points, my own house, I conceived it, I designed it, I helped to build it, I love it, and I live in it. So, the house was just unbelievably important to her and to Scott 
as an embodiment of you know, their, their viewpoint about the relationship between human beings and the land. And um, for Scott, it was, you know, he saw homesteading as really the most successful, and he, you all know this, the most successful part of his political project was really his um, advocacy of back to the land and uh, uh, homesteading. Uh, one biographer said of him, only in the isolated private sphere provided by homesteading could a radical resistance and constructive challenge to capitalist, cult capitalist culture be nurtured. And Scott <clears throat> saw that what he called the simple liver or homesteader and the social radical as working towards complementary goals. He said both are trying to get at the root of, li of the life problem though both attack it from different angles. Both desire a fuller life, though each go different roads to get it. Both are realists. They face the world and fight indifference, sloth, and reaction. And one thing they hated was sloth. You know, they were pretty stern taskmasters about you know, getting stuff done, um, which they did. Okay, so, where is where are some of these ideas coming from? Well, as you uh, likely know, um, Scott Nearing was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and elsewhere before he was um, dismissed uh, as a result of political controversy and lived for uh, about 10 years in the Arden community in Delaware, not far from uh, Philadelphia. The animator of that of that community was this um, uh, man, Frank Stevens, uh, who wrote about Arden that the underlying thought is that the study of medieval life in Merry England, as charming and lovely a time as any of which history has record will create for us a life so picturesque and fruitful under economic conditions equally free and just and without the loss of anything that civilization has really gained. So it's like England of the Middle Ages, but with modern life tacked onto it with nothing lost from the past. Of course, this is like the most insanely romanticized view of the Middle Ages that you could possibly imagine. Like, you know, serfdom is now this, you know, fabulous lifestyle to be um, emulated. But what, what's really interesting from our point of view is that it's at Arden that Scott, and I apologize for how crummy the images on the left, but that's Scott at Arden, and that's where he started building with stone in this community that's about <clears throat> looking back to the Middle Ages and to traditional, oops, wow. traditional, that's not right, traditional uh, modes of construction that were from the pre-modern period. And so you can see that he's thinking along the lines that, that he and Helen would be implementing later on to some degree. So here are two cottages at Arden, and they kind of mirror, you know, the old English, you know, cottage of the rural countryside of the, you know, very traditional kind of villages. And this approach derives ultimately from William Morris, who was the great um, spokesperson for the revival of handicraft in the mid-19th century first in Great Britain, but then really all over the Western world. He was all over the Anglo world in particular. He was widely, widely read and extremely influential. So well, let me ask you, I'll take it, rest my voice, and I'll ask you a question. So this is like class. Okay. <laughs> so 1859, 1860, so what was happening in England at that time? The industrialization, rather, the Industrial Revolution. So it's a moment of incredible industrialization, you know, particularly in England, which led the rest of 
blend continental Europe in terms of industrialization, urbanization, the some of the earliest discussions of environmental pollution taking place at that time, and into that anxiety about modern production and modern world, the modern world and what industrialization had wrought, William Morris begins to write and philosophize about a return to traditional ways of making things. And his writings really echo those of Karl Marx, which are just contemporary, um, in, the, in the sense that they express a concern about the worker under an, in the industrial capitalist system, the worker's alienation from his or her product. You know, that the worker's no longer designing things and crafting them with a kind of, you know, love of the final product, but instead of standing in the assembly line, doing one part of a process that he or she is completely alienated from. And so both you know, Marx and the, with the socialist movement, and which Morris gets involved in later in his life, and Morris with what comes known as the arts and crafts movement, advocate for a return to what they imagine, you know, particularly Morris, to have been this much happier arrangement in the Middle Ages before industrialization with the craft guilds where Perhaps people were kind of empowered to design things and make them. And things were made, importantly, crucially, made by hand, not by machines. So his manifesto comes in this house, which is built very early in his life, um, designed by him and by an architect named Philip Webb. This house um, in Bexley Heath in England, which you know, it's built in one piece, 1859-1860, what it's intended to look like a vernacular or a kind of everyday building that had accumulated over time. And there's an extreme avoidance of any elements that would seem to have been industrially produced or mass produced. And the other thing that was central to his point of view was that there should be no applied ornament. So, and you know, of course, this is just a moment when, you know, mills and factories are churning out plaster, composition, wood, all kinds of ornament, pressed metal, very, very cheaply, very quickly, and it can be kind of tacked up onto a building that has no fundamental connection to. And Morris was very much against that development in the building, building trades. And that return to craftsmanship, to artisanry, that became known as the Arts and Crafts Movement, inspires many, many others, architects, designers, you know, fine artists, ultimately Frank Lloyd Wright, who in turn then inspires the nearings. Well, I expected them to have been, you know, just pouring over William Morris, but they weren't. And Crazily enough, the construction method they adopted was the one developed by one of the great skyscraper architects of the early 20th century, or the turn of the 20th century, Ernest Black. So I read that and I'm like, what the heck? You know, um, they're supposed to be back to the lenders. Why are they reading this guy? You know, the designer of the Singer Building, you know, the world's tallest building in 1908, which you can see has no relationship to, or very little relationship to, the kind of construction that they advocated and that Morris had advocated. Steel frame building, clad with a kind of masonry shell. Incidentally, it was demolished not long after it was built and eclipsed as the tallest building in the world. But it was Woolworth building by 1913. So, when I read this, when I read, first of all, that they loved Frank Lloyd Wright, and second, that they used a method designed by Ernest Flagg. I thought, well, boy, this is really turned out to be kind of cool. So, the, but the thing that they found in Flagg was <clears throat> this strategy for self-building. So kind of do-it-yourself 
construction method that Flagg um, popularized in a book from 1922 called Small Houses, Their Economic Design and Construction. And of course, this is right after the end of World War I, and there's a lot of concern internationally about um, housing, the housing crises, particularly in urban areas, and how that could be solved. And this was seen as one response. Now, Flagg wrote, the theory for the design of these homes, referring to those built using a system, is that the most economic way of obtaining good results is to apply the great fundamental principles of art and depend upon them for beauty rather than upon the use either of applied ornament, figure out how that is, or more expensive materials. So he's against luxury, although you should see the house he lived in on Staten Island with like 25 rooms or something gigantic. Um, so when he refers to the great fundamental principles, he's referring back to the classical tradition in which he was trained at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, which was where many American architects went to train before there were many architecture schools in the US. <clears throat> but he built a number of demonstration houses that still survive on Staten Island, where his big house was. Huh. And here's see a couple of um, uh, views of them on Toad Hill, which is overlooks New York Harbor and is ringed by the um, mansions of the mafiosi who <laughs> are drawn to that part of Staten Island. Having lived there, I can say that. Um, so he, he does these, builds a series of um, cottages, which he then rents out and sells some of them. And they are demonstrations of this method which he um, developed and wrote about, which um, you see a sketch of it there on the right hand side. And basically, and so anybody here who knows more about this can correct me. But um, you know, there was a wonderful demonstration here a number of years ago where I really got to see, the, see it done, and that was so helpful to me in visualizing how this worked. But um, basically, as the, as the um, image on the right-hand side shows, there's, um, the structure comprises this stone facing and then this concrete center central core that's poured in place, the shuttering, the wood shuttering that into which it's poured is movable and reusable. So that was a really important point of the system. And the materials then were largely harvested on the site. Then that's particularly the stones and some of the elements of the concrete. So the um, aggregate or the gravel and sand yeah. in the concrete could be obtained. And there was a gravel pit here that the one nodding, so I haven't gotten it wrong. They have one in Vermont as well. They had their own kind of pit so they could obtain some of their um, material. Now, <clears throat> the thing that I find so fascinating about this is that they're building with stones from the land, right? And there's a very important emphasis on using locally available materials, but at the same time, they're building with concrete, which is the very material that's then being used for tall commercial buildings or warehouses or factories or whatever. And it's, they're, they're, they're even incorporating into it wire, uh, metal elements in the manner of someone of reinforced concrete. So as much as it's a traditional method that announces in its appearance, what you see right here, the careful selection, the loving selection, as Helen talked about it, of the stones, at the same time, it also benefits from certain modern advances. And that's what, that's one of the things that, uh, Flag emphasized about the about the method. He um, built a demonstration house for McCall's magazine in 1923, which was widely published. 
and he uh, claimed that it was going to be much more affordable than a traditionally built house, which ended up being somewhat debatable whether it was so so uh, so cost effective. But it was very widely publicized in Collier, Scientific American, Architectural Forum, McCall's, you know, all these magazines have articles about this method. One of his boosters um, also published a number of magazine articles in 1924, as well as a book that was called Build a Home, Save a Third, yeah. and that appeared in 1924. And the uh, Nearings quote all these publications. So they were very knowledgeable about how this method had been developed and popularized um, through the uh, 1920s up to the time that they start building. Now the other really fascinating figure who they refer to, who I got really kind of intrigued by, was this man named Fraser Foreman Peters, who you probably heard about, who um, began building utilitarian structures on his farm in Westport, Connecticut, um, in, during the Depression, and then um, formed a kind of utopian community there um, at about the same time of people who built um, um, similar houses. He, was, he published widely about what he was doing, including a book called Houses of Stone, which is 1933. And then he wrote some kind of, some sort of self-help books for builders, including Pour Yourself a House, Low-Cost Building with Concrete and Stone. <laughs> which appeared in 1949, and Buying a House Worth the Money from 1950. And most importantly, in 1936, uh, 1937, excuse me, wrote a book called um, Without Benefit of Architect, <laughs> in which he said, this book does not aim to replace or eliminate the architect. It merely hopes to serve as a prayer book I think what he really meant was a primer okay. to those who, for one reason or another, have to build, buy or build without benefit of architect. So he wanted to have it both ways. On one hand, he's providing this book that you could, you, you could buy instead of having an architect. On the other hand, he got licensed <laughs> as an architect himself and started a little practice of designing these stone houses, one of which was a very widely published one that was built by the historical author, um, many of you probably know, from Maine, Kenneth Roberts, who lived down in Cane Mugport, and built a, uh, who commissioned Peters to design a stone house for him that's, that's uh, still there. So the Peters, who the Nearings read, had this kind of um, um, utopian community that they called points of view, because it was supposed to incorporate all different points of view. But as early as 1934, Scott Nearing was not hot on the idea of a utopian community in Vermont, although there was a community there of which they were a part. He said that their Vermont property should be organized and equipped to take care of a few people who needed to come to the country for a rest or else to be out of sight <laughs> on the down low, right? <laughs> Nothing ambitious and no hurry, but there should be a community house with a good cellar in which are stored apples, potatoes, and nuts. In other words, it should be food self-sufficient, also fuel, some with small cabins scattered, scattered about. You could give people a basic subsistence pretty cheaply. But he said to Helen, this does not mean a colony, any underlying colony, for emphasis. So Carey's, Corey's, Peter's books all appeared in the decade during which the Nearings were constructing their buildings with stone. And they cite all of those books in their homesteading um, primer, Living a Good Life, in 1954. But the two that stand out of the set were right and John Burroughs, who was a very well-known um, author uh, and farmer. And they 
cited frequently, as you probably know, the 1914 edition of Burroughs' book, which was called Signs and Seasons, originally published in 1886. So reaching way back into this um, uh, 19th century tradition. And one of the things that they uh, <coughs> admire in Burroughs' writings is um, his passion for stone. Mm. What he called, and I love this, wild stone. Mm -hmm. As though like the stones are like you know, wild animals. Mm -hmm. You know, not harvested in, not domesticated. Not domesticated, thank you, Lola, but rather stone out in the woods, yes. Um, I just want to say that um, if you were building a wall or if you wanted to be, to be, be able to see the stones, you could put stones on both sides of the wall. That's so, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, they did. If you look at the uh, the garden wall, has stone on both sides. Uh, right. There's the house and the other stone. Right. So this is for um, a house, and you can see it has frame on the inside for lime and plaster. Yes. Yeah. I'd just like to point out that. S typical slip form stonework does not look like that rendering Thank there. Yes. No, because the installer can't really see the face of the stone that he's setting up against the slip form. And so he's limited in his ability to um, really see what that stone's going to look like and what, and get the joints uniform. And I think if you look at the stone, here on the nearing's place, you'll see that it's actually quite different than that picture because you have this limitation. The beauty is it's quick, but the limitation is you don't fit it together like a stonemason does when he's laying free laying stone. And so this drawing that we're looking at here is very romanticized, I think, in that it shows a very uniformity of fit and joint. And I'd just like to point out that that's not, in fact, the way this work, this Stonework looks. Right. So I mean, that your comments right on is really interesting because because I think that when you know, particularly Helen describes building with stone, it's on the one hand very um, thoughtful and deliberate in terms of picking the stones, but then when you pull away the formwork, there's an element of surprise. Yeah. I think she. I think she's she kind of intimates that that. That, that it has both of those elements, but that's absolutely right. Well, it is, it's, to me, it's a little interesting because on one hand, you're talking about handmade craftsmanship, but on the other hand, this is a more sort of factory-made way of laying stone than a traditional stonemason laying individual pieces that are fit together, each one to the next. Right. So it, there's a little bit of a contradiction there. Well, I think, the, I think um, not just in their philosophy, but in you know, when people write about homesteading, they talk about this all the time, that there are huge contradictions, right? That, you know, that, and, sure. you know, they, when they came, and, there, you know, there's a wood house, wood frame house that they lived in for quite a while on the property, uh, you know, that's eventually demolished. And in fact, they write about how all those old wood houses are, you know, in the end, they're not going to be any good. They're going to be not level, they're susceptible to rot, blah, blah, blah. You know, even though they've been there a hundred years or whatever, right? <laughs> uh, you know, if you were truly, right, about minimizing your impact on the land, about minimizing your use of resources, why wouldn't you reuse what was already there? Right? Mm -hmm. so there? So there are certain contradictions, and the king of contradictions is, of course, Thoreau, who they always, the Marys always claimed is a major you know, inspiration. Thoreau goes to live in the cabin, but of course he's like not far from Concord and his family and you know, people know about all that. But you know, it's the taking of a position that I find so very really interesting. Yes. Is that what they did on the floor? Or is that a different method altogether? Yeah. I don't know. I don't this is just so. laying uh, on sand. This isn't part of the flag method. Well, but this isn't sand. It's concrete. No, sand underneath. Oh, underneath, oh. Okay. Yeah, they lay the stone down and then, uh, you know, the uh, slate, I guess it is, and uh, filled it in with concrete. Okay. So that didn't involve any form or anything. You can see that there's a picture over here of where she's laying the floor in here, hmm. trying to keep it level and so forth. So that's a little different situation. 
And, um, you know, in, I mean, the, in Vermont, what's really interesting is, you know, they talk about how they're skiing down a hill in the winter, and they come to this ginormous boulder, and they decide, well, that's going to be the back wall of the house. <laughs> and, you know, which is fun enough, right? But then, they really talk about that as a, they talk about that boulder as a person. You know, like this warm presence. I, you know, I can't remember all the language that they use, but it's like, a, you know, it's their muse. It's their, you know, their soft place to land is a gigantic boulder. So it's, you know, their their interest in these materials used in different ways is is really strong. Now, uh, so this is these are a couple of houses that Peter's built in Westport. You can see that the. Some of them are quite large. That's his house there on the left, and this is one that he did on commission. And then, you know, there were a few people who took up this flag method and really developed it, um, although it never kind of achieved the widespread usage that flag would, would have liked to, to have had. One of them is this Arnold F. Meyer, who was in um, the upper Midwest, I think in Minneapolis, or, um, <clears throat> or Wisconsin, I can't remember which. But in any case, so he built like 25 of these houses. And what I find wonderful about this photo is you can see how totally different it is from the wood frame houses around it. And this little suburban area that's like massive stone thing clinging to the ground and then the very kind of big construction of the wood frame house um, around it. And of course, and Meyer was actually writing to Peters and to other authors about uh, construction. And so that's one of, um, <clears throat> that's a um, book I mentioned before by Burroughs, Signs and Seasons, just in a 19th century edition. One of the points of departure, I think one of the two important ones, the other being Franklin Wright's on architecture from uh, 1940. And there they are in the prime. Um, So, although they began by renovating in Vermont an existing wood frame structure, they started to imagine building a new house um, in the 1930s, and they uh, uh, complete this uh, complete their first building project, which is not in stone but in wood, in Vermont, and they call it the Swedish Matchbox. And that's in 1934, a kind of wood cabin. And they more or less abandoned wood construction um, after that point. They then build what they call Scott's Cabin, which is uh, made of stone and has one massive window overlooking the mountains. And by 1937, they added another room. And the building of a separate Working space for Scott is always super important to both of them. For the reason that, um, that Helen says is that um, he has to be uh, insulated from the visitors who come to see them as they become more and more well known through their writings and speaking. They have tons of visitors and she doesn't want him to be distracted so he always has this kind of um, separate space. This attitude of, uh, you know, I think the attitude of Frank Lloyd Wright is very visible in this early project, um, where the furnishings are extremely um, spartan. And in speaking about furnishings, uh, the Nearings really echoed Frank Lloyd Wright when they wrote, wrote about the early building projects. No old furniture was dragged in, or carpets or curtains. As far as possible, all furniture was built into the original design and was an integral part of the architecture. There, echoing Wright uh, in, uh, on architecture, where he says that the ideal of organic, organic simplicity demanded the abolition of old furniture and other forms of superficial decoration. So right from the beginning, they're very much following the lines of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. 
As some of you may know, from 1937, they are building houses to sell, which is part of the economic model of how they're going to um, survive and then built their definitive house um, in, in uh, Vermont, as I said at the outset, between uh, 1939 and um, 1942. And I talked about that boulder that really is the focal point of the house, which Helen described as a faithful friend whose 20 foot wide body kept out the north wind, who was cool to lean against in summer, and who brought a living part of nature into the home. Which I think is, is quite beautiful, and uh, comes out of, again, this passion for stone, which is uh, also, I think, expressed in other contemporary writers. Yes. Are there any images of that house and that stone and the relationship of the house to the stone? Um, there, there are. I don't have any with me. I apologize. But yeah, um, in the stone book, there, I think there's a picture yeah, of it. Yeah. We had an interesting visitor who was a contractor hired by the people who presently just bought that house, and he was talking about what a challenge it is to uh, kind of keep that house uh, from uh, from being wet. Right. Chris could probably see that. Oh. Yeah, he said the the, boat, the water. Yeah, right. yeah, there's a lot of water issues and problems in the house that they're trying to solve now. Yeah, it was sold recently, not too long ago. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, continuing the good life in 1979, the Mirage urged the readers to construct new houses, not limit old ones, whatever possible. And he said, each new venture will be a chance to express your own ideas and to improve your skill as you strive to work out the very best product of which you are capable. Following such practices, you will create and learn. Which I, which I think is really an um, interesting statement because it goes right back to this body of thought that they're coming out of about um, resisting professionalization, resisting industrial production, and instead wanting to empower, you know, sub-builders. And what I think Troy to suggest here is that uh, in doing so, they, they look to a variety of sources, and some of them I find extremely paradoxical, uh, you know, Flagg and Wright, but you know, also Burroughs and, and other writers who can clearly see the imprint on their thought. Uh, and in so doing, I think they wove together a story that was extremely compelling about their actual construction of these buildings. So the buildings were super appealing visually, and the story that they told about the conceptualization and what they were supposed to represent was, all, was equally compelling and drew enormous numbers of people to them. And um, you know, the, I think the actual construction was really crucial to that, to that narrative that was so powerful and drew people so, so uh, strongly to them. So I'll stop there, uh, answer any questions or deflect to Warren. Yeah. Uh, don't do that. Yeah. That was really interesting. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, I just wanted to make one note based on what I was just saying is that you open with that image of falling water. That well, house wait, also leaks like crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's really not a livable home. Well, when I was picking yeah. um, images, I almost picked the recent one where they're <laughs> trying to prop up those yeah. cantilever porches that are all kind of saggy uh, because yeah. they're right over the water. Mm -hmm. Right, so concrete sitting right on top of water. I mean, that's a tough maintenance problem. So you're right. I mean, you know, and Wright, of course, you know, such an interesting writer and such an um, incredible self-promoter, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly to the Nearings, in a different way, but similarly, right, 
there's the building, and then there's the really compelling story about, you know, I picked this spot, and there was their favorite rock, you know, and I put the house right over the rock, and the rocks come out of the floor inside. Yeah. If you've been there, you can see this. And so that's, you know, I mean, it's like a crazy powerful thing in the 1930s. And I think the Marys has some more ability to weave together the, uh, a way of describing the project that was extremely compelling and the actual buildings themselves were also very compelling. Yes? Um, I just wanted to point out that that chimney over there is similar to what the slipcorn wall looks like. Yeah. So would there have been a, a reform thing on this side of it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And they modified flags, you know, uh, it's a really small, we have one from Vermont out in the shed. It was only two feet high, whereas a lot of other buildings were much bigger. But to lift the rocks, you know, the stone and stuff like that, and work off of, um, you know, the staging that they built, it, it felt like really it worked really well for them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so the other the other aspect of uh, the flag system was that it was supposed to be modular, mm -hmm. and so he uh, actually sold graph paper that was fitted to his modular system, so you could design your own house that would be in its dimensions would be suitable to this module that he thought was the most kind of effective, and it was. Ultimately, classical, as he thought, went back to you know, ancient architecture. Yeah. As someone who's done some of this type of work over the years, um, I would just like to point out that there's an extreme amount of concrete mixing involved. Yep. So you need to have somebody who's really good with the mixer. Mm -hmm. Because you're pushing, <laughs> you're pushing a lot of cement. Yeah, that was yeah. Scott's job in the, in the yeah. wheelbarrow. And I congratulate him because he yeah. must have mixed a lot of he did. It's a matter of You said you were going to ask some nice questions. Okay, I am, I am. But I'm just wondering, do you have any sense of to what extent people really took the Nearings method and made their own houses? How far did this go? Or was it just mm -hmm. interesting but then too tough for most people? It was. I think it was really too tough for most people. I mean, I don't really know. Um, you know, to my knowledge, that's not documented. Huh. I, know, I know a bunch of people who did their foundation using the nearing method. Yeah. We had two speakers this summer, Greg Jolie and um, Dana Ward, who's a professor at Pitcher College. He lives in Freedom in the summer, and he built his uh, foundation. But I don't know. Uh, we've, we've had some visitors over the years that have... Uh, said they built their entire house out of stone based on that method. Mm -hmm. uh, but the numbers aren't great. You know, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, you know, Flag, you know, Flag thought he was going to revolutionize construction. And never went to it. Could you explain how the foundation works? I'm kind of curious. Yeah, well, it, it's pretty funky, actually. I mean, they basically dig a trench, and they pour concrete and stone into the trench. And, and leveled it off, and then um, they just started in one corner with a uh, L-shaped form, yeah. and got that form. But they didn't go below cross. Uh, yeah, they went down uh, between three and four feet. Yeah, yeah. but it was really uh, they didn't use the forms underground. Just the trenches. It was just uh, basically a trench. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is pretty amazing that these buildings mm -hmm. are still. Well, it's kind of. Kind of <laughs> it's but kind they of did fill it with. Uh, Reinforcement, like Kevin said, you know, metal and rebar and stuff like that. But was the trench in the shape of the perimeter of the oh, yeah. house? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there was nothing in the center, or the center was at le ground level, and then there was right. a trench. Kind exactly. Of right. Yeah. This, this room here is probably done that way. This stone is on grade, if you will, mm -hmm. and so there's probably a trench around this. Where the part, the kitchen sits over, the bathroom sits over, mm -hmm. it's over a basement, and so oh, wow. it's eight feet tall. And yeah. the walls on the inside of the basement look like you can see a two-foot form line going all the way up the wall. No, this, this 
This basement was a poured basement in the new house. Did they hand the dig side. all of that here? Uh, no, they had a backhoe. Uh -huh. They started, when they bought this little piece of land, they came down here and they started digging, and it is clay. And they gave up pretty quickly and, and had a backhoe or some machine in here to dig uh, this this basement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but they did, I believe, they dug the trench for the barn, what we call the barn, and the stone walls here and up at the old house. And um, Helen would have insisted on this site, is my understanding. Oh, yeah. She, like, uh, their house in Vermont had a big picture window overlooking Stratton Mountain. She wanted this beautiful mm -hmm. view. Um, and that was the big draw for this piece a of A machine, land. huh? What? He brought in a machine, huh? Uh, he was for in this, his 80s. Yeah. 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 That's in back. You mentioned the gravel pit as a source of some materials. Well, what about the source for larger stones? From the property? I mean, not, they didn't dig down to get them, but... Well, they dig like this, um, you know, the slope right by the driveway when they were digging out for this property. You can see that there's a lot of pictures of them just going, just digging on the side of the hill. And that's where they got a lot of the stone for these buildings here. And a lot of, but this is real clay, marine clay here. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not easy stuff. Thank you, Kevin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.